Um, I'm Stefan Kraber. I work at Canonical. I'm the LXC and NXT project leader. Um, and today we're going to be talking about system containers and kernel features. Right. So, um, briefly, what are system containers? Um, they're the oldest type of containers, really. They originated with BSD jails, uh, I don't know, 12 years ago, thereabout. Um, then Linux V server, uh, server zones, uh, then OpenVZ, LXC, and now LXT, which I'm working on. Um, the, the main goal of system containers is to behave exactly like a physical system or virtual machine. Um, there are no special images or anything. You run a full unmodified Linux distro effectively inside your container and interact with that exactly as if it was a normal system. Um, no virtualization is needed because that's still a container. That's kind of the whole point of containers. Now, as for Lex as for LXD itself, um, LXD is a somewhat new, I mean, I keep saying new, but it's like three or something years old at this point, um, container manager with a REST API that you can easily script. It's got a nice and user-friendly um, command line. It's pretty fast. It is secure by default. Um, we use user namespaces for all of our containers unless you opt out of that. You can even have uh, per container uh, maps of your IDs and GIDs if you want to make them even safer. We use all of the available LSMs, so SecComp, um, AppArmor. Uh, we use capabilities. We use pretty much every single bit of kernel API that's available to make them safe. And it's pretty scalable. You can use it locally for like your two or three containers, or you can go like full cluster and run 10,000 containers if you feel like it. That's just same, same API, same CLI, same user experience, and you can scale very easily. Um, for those of you who've played with Chromebooks somewhat lately, uh, they've got a new Linux apps feature on the Chromebooks. Well, that's LexD. Uh, they're running, LexD is shipping on all the Chromebooks these days, and that's used to run um, Debian containers directly on your Chromebook. Now, for what LexD isn't, uh, as I mentioned, it's not a virtualization technology. It does not use any CPU extensions for that regard. You can totally run LXD on a Raspberry Pi or whatever if you feel like it. It works on just about every architecture out there. It is also not a fork of LXC. It is um, a Go daemon that uses the Go LXC binding and libLXC under the hood to drive the kernel interactions and use all the nice kernel features because doing that directly from Go is not always pleasant. Um, and it's also not an application container manager. So we will not be running Docker containers with FlexD. Uh, we don't really have an intention of doing that anytime soon. You can totally install Docker inside a LexD container if you feel like, if you feel like it. That works just fine. Um, but we really see application containers as a way of distributing a particular piece of software, whereas our focus is to run entire machines inside a container. Uh, also, for the rest of the talk, as we're going to be going through a bunch of new kernel features and um, other bits of interesting API we are using um, for system containers. I'll mostly be focusing on unprivileged containers. So I don't really recommend anyone run privileged containers in general. Um, so when we say something can't be done or we need new kernel APIs, it usually means something cannot be done inside an unprivileged container. Yes, if you've got full root access within a privileged container, you can probably do it, but you can also probably break the entire system. So just something to keep in mind for the rest of this talk. Now, uh, the first thing I want to go through is um, devices. Like, why would you want devices attached to a container? Well, maybe you want a GPU. Maybe you want a, some USB device. Uh, maybe you're doing HPC and you care about InfiniBand networking and RDMA. Uh, maybe you need network direct network access to, because you don't want to use bridging and all that stuff on your fancy 100 gigabit network card, for example. Uh, or you just want access to any character or block device on the system, say a USB serial link or some science equipment or whatever. Um, containers are a bit special in that regard. Uh, there's no such thing as a device namespace. There's no nice way of touching devices to a container. Um, containers can run UDEV, and LXD containers usually do, but they don't really get any U events, which makes that somewhat 
pointless um, until we've got some kernel API we're working on. Um, containers also cannot use dev tempfs, um, at least not in a very useful way, which means that you need to pre-create all the device nodes that a given container needs to use. Um, that also gets funny when a container is running and you want to inject a new device inside it because as I'll show in a tiny bit, you can't actually make node inside a and previous container. So you need to do use man propagation tricks to propagate a device from the host into a running container. Um, right, so let's just show a, a few interesting things. Uh, let's do that, and let's do that. And OK, uh, the first thing I want to show is the entire make node issue. Uh, it's, I'm running a modern kernel, so I'm running a 418 kernel on there, which has an interesting behavior. Um, interesting in that it broke a bunch of user space, but um, you can actually make node, oops, uh, it already exists, so let's just delete and create again. There, I've cr make noded um, major one uh, minus three, that means dev null. So if we compare dev blah with dev null, Eh, they look kind of the same. You can write to both of them, and major and minor lines up. OK, so that should work, right? So if I was to write to dev null, no problem whatsoever. Now if I write to, write to blah, doesn't work. Um, that's the new behavior in the 418 kernel, which does let you make node things, but also marks them in a way that makes them completely useless afterwards. Um, that's slightly frustrating for any piece of software that tries to make node, and then if that fails, do something sensible, because now it doesn't fail, it just fails when you try to use it later on. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Uh, the old behavior was that make node just wasn't allowed at all. Um, in any way, like, even though you can make node these days, you can't make node anything useful, so you might as well consider you don't have it. Um, as far as devices, let's look at a GPU case. So um, I've got a container. Um, this container is kind of boring because, oh, I forgot to delete the device, sorry. Uh, it should have been empty. Well, let's make it empty. There we go. So no dev DRI nodes. Um, and now let's say I want to pass a GPU and I want a specific one, so I'm actually going to give it a PCI address. Now, we need to do the interesting logic of going through a sys, figure out what device nodes are tied to that particular, uh, what driver is tied to a particular address, what devices are tied to it. Lexd does that. It uses a man propagation trick to inject those devices inside the container, and you get those. And you can sometimes actually make use of that. That's much better. Uh, so that's what I'm seeing here. Um, which is the Unigen Heaven benchmark um, running inside a container that's got a GPU access and access to the X server. And as you can see, that's running just fine. All right, let's close that stuff. And go back to this. So that's kind of where things are, but we also added a new kernel API recently that lets you actually inject your events from user space into a particular container. So going forward, the idea is that we will have LexD, as it does today, listen to your events. If they are relevant to the container, they can then be injected inside the container, which then means you dev inside the container can react to them and can do useful things. Um, we've got people trying to run Kodi and X servers and whatnot inside containers, and they've got a bit of a problem when they plug like a USB keyboard or mice. Uh, that kind of stuff just doesn't show up, and X just ignores it. You need to actually bounce X so that it notices something's been plugged. Um, with your event injection, that's been done by Christian Brown on my team. We're going to be able to, to fix that. Um, that's already mainline. We just need to use it from user space. Um, another thing that we're... Um, looking into for, well, that, that we need to deal with for system containers is security modules. So in, if you've got a full machine, you, want to, you may want to protect your services. That means attaching a Palmer policy or SecCom policies or SLNX directly to a bunch of services running in there. Uh, sometimes the init system will do that for you. Sometimes you do it on the side, whatever you feel like. But that was a bit of a problem when we couldn't do that inside containers. Um, we also had the issue back in the days where the host policies, um, 
at least for Aparma, which is path-based, were actually leaking into the container. So if you had a policy for some binary on the host and the same binary existed in the container, the policy would just magically apply to it, even though it might be a completely different distro and the, pro the profile might not be relevant at all. Um, and when you do nesting as well, so you run Docker inside the LXD container, it kind of matters for Docker to be able to run its normal Abama profile um, or a sec comp or whatever else. Um, so that's been, we'll go into some more details slightly later, but like that's been fixed uh, for Abama at least. Um, it is possible to load Abama profiles as an unprivileged user effectively, so as root inside an unprivileged container. And have things namespaced in a way that the container has its own set of profiles, the host profiles don't leak onto the container, but the host policy still applies on top of whatever is loaded inside the container. Um, it does get tricky for some other APIs, like for example, anything that's going to be based on eBPF is not suitable for that, because eBPF cannot be trusted uh, for unprivileged users, um, mostly because eBPF can be used for timing attacks uh, and effectively exploiting the Spectre bug. So ever since the Spectre meltdown mitigations, eBPF is no longer allowed for unprivileged users, and so not available for unprivileged containers anymore. Now, for Apama, as I mentioned, Apama does support um, running inside containers. So that's done through internal nesting support in Apama. You can create a namespace, create a, effectively a stack, and then say that's your outer profile, that's your inner profile, and if that profile allows um, policy loading, then the container can load extra policies. That lets you load, unload, list profiles, um, but there is one big limitation right now, which is single level. So you can do it in a container, but the container cannot then create a second level inside it. That's something that's being looked at, but there are a bunch of missing kernel LSM hooks that need to be sorted for that. Um, but I can show you that part already. So uh, let's get out of that container. And so for Apama, I've got a basic container. Um, let's install something that's confined. So there's that convenient Hello World snap. Um, which, if it feels like installing, um, comes with a convenient AppArmor profile and a test. Yeah, it does. There you go. So if we look now, AppArmor status shows that the profile has been loaded. Actually, a bunch of profiles for different subcommands in there. And if we run the command itself, it's fine. If we run the evil subcommand, which tries to do something it's not supposed to be able to do, it is not about able to do it. And if we go and grab stuff, we should see, yeah, the bottom one shows a denied by Abama, uh, preventing it to r from writing into a path it was not supposed to. So that's Abama stacking. Now, the real thing we want to get to is uh, what's called LSM stacking and namespacing. With that, we instead of having like a per LSM, like per like specific to Apama type solution, um, all the major LSMs should be able to stack and run at the same time. So you should be able to boot a system with both a Linux and Apama enabled at the same time. Uh, the sites that you display LSM for the system, so the main LSM is going to be a C Linux. And then when you start a container, set that container's display LSM to Apama, if it's you know, Debian, Ubuntu, or whatever else is using Apama. And then inside there, they can interact with Apama and pretty much never know that SC Linux is even a thing on the system. The SC Linux host policy will still apply, so it, any access actually ends up going through the entire stack and being validated by both. Um, that's work that's been going on for a few years now by Casey Schaffler and John Johansson. There are patches that do work. Um, we're still pretty far, I think, from them being merged, but that's where we're headed, and it's going to be pretty neat, because it will let us run Ubuntu and Debian containers on CentOS and having both the host and containers fully secure. And similarly, we'll be able to run Android or CentOS containers on Ubuntu and have a C Linux run inside the container. So that's going to be pretty darn neat. Now, another interesting topic is uh, file capabilities. Um, you may know that thing, in some distros, things like ping, uh, MTR, some of the um, privilege escalation wrappers and whatnot actually use file capabilities instead of CentOS because it's much more granular and, in general, a better idea. Uh, we had a bit of a problem with containers in that it was not possible for unprivileged, unprivileged users, so 
root inside in a previous container to set a capability. The main issue being there that if you could do that, then you would be able to exploit it from outside the container, so that was considered to be bad and therefore blocked. The v3 file capabilities support that's been merged now a few kernel releases ago changes that. As part of the capability record on disk, it stores what the root, root UID was, um, which then lets, know, lets, lets the kernel know when to actually consider the capability. Uh, we can see an example of that if I go in a CentOS container, if I can type, there we go, and say install HTTPD. Oopsie, sorry, let me fix that. There you go. So I'm um, installing HTTPD. Again, if network wants to cooperate, we'll see. Um, cool moment. Oh, well, network doesn't. S eh, okay. It failed, but then it seems to still work. Okay, fine. I'm retrying. There we go. All right, so HTTPD is installed. Um, that used to fail miserably. Like, uh, a kernel that doesn't support v3 caps would just fail the unpack because CPI wouldn't be able to set the capability. Now, if we check that one file that ships with the package is um, has got two capabilities set on it, and that works exactly as expected. Uh, and if we look, uh, rip, uh, Apache can work just fine. Another thing that we've had issues in the past has been mounting stuff inside containers. Um, that's been a bit of a recurring problem. Some people do want that for things like loop-mounted files or uh, mounting squash FSs or mounting network storage or even like passing some networked block device and wanting to mount that in the container. It is not supported in general because it's a very bad idea from a security point of view. That's because the kernel will have to pass the block device you give it that the user has complete control over, and you can then exploit very interesting kernel bugs and do a bunch of nasty things. Um, in the case of the loop device, there's also some issue with you being able to still modify the device after it's been mounted uh, and confuse the kernel even more. So, um, yeah, that's a bit of a problem. We do not expect file systems to really fix that, but um, there are some ways out of there. For virtual file systems, it's usually pretty safe, so we should be able to make things like NFS work just fine in theory. Um, though NFS is a bit of a weird beast sometimes. Uh, one thing that has been done is Fuse. So we can actually mount anything that Fuse supports. And we can see that here. Uh, I've got that container. That container has got a SquashFS, and I can mount stuff, and that works just fine. So that's unprivileged few supports that's been merged, I think, in 4.17 or 4.18, thereabout. Took a while. Uh, we had it in Ubuntu for a long time, but upstreaming it took a while. So that's one way of doing things. Um, the other thing that we're working on is um, the issue of UIDs and GID maps, which is a bit of a problem with mounts in general, uh, because you may want some, like in our case, we're dealing with, with uh, system containers. So we've got a full root file system per container. We don't have the entire issue of like read-only images and all that stuff. But uh, we still have the issue of having containers with different maps and wanting to share data between them. That's a bit of a problem in general. Um, right now, there's no good solution for that. You just, you, you can try doing uh, POSIX ACLs and that kind of works, but it's very confusing for people. Um, and for the root file system itself, it means that when we create the container, we've got to shift it, which means we need to go through every single file inside there. We need to change the user UID and GID, and we need to change any POSIX ACLs, and we need to change any file system capabilities. Not very fun. It's fine. It works. Uh, we've done it for years now, but eh, we want something faster. And that's what ShiftFS gets us. It's in progress. It's been written originally by James Bollomley. I've got Seth Forshi on my team actively working on fixing a bunch of extra issues with it. Um, with ShiftFS, it lets you take a directory that's not mapped and tell the kernel, please mount it over there, but apply this map. And you can do that multiple times to different containers with different maps, and they will all see it as their own UIDs and GIDs. Um, and 
things should just work effectively. So that's pretty interesting, and hopefully we'll be there within the next year. Now, the other thing that we are working on is, like, what if you trust your users? I mean, that might be a thing. Um, right now, there's no way in the kernel to allow those mounts. It's just not possible. But uh, with work done, being done right now by Taiko Anderson, we can, with SecComp, intercept system calls in user space. And then I'll have user space run, a com run whatever it wants as real root, which then lets us catch mount, for example, compare the arguments to a whitelist we've got. And if we consider that this one container we actually trust, uh, and we're fine with that file system being mounted from that location to that location, we can perform that action as real root, and then move on, and you've just perf performed the mount, things just work. So we're pretty excited about this particular feature. Mount is one of the things we want to use it for. There are a bunch more use cases. Like we do want to let you make node things like dev null and not have it be useless. So that same feature will let us do that. Another thing we're working on, well, we've been working on in the past, is uh, limits and something that containers kind of need. Um, I'm just going to go with demo instead for that since we're running out of time a bit. Um, let's see. So here I've got laptop up uptime is two days. If I go inside the container, we can see that the uptime is a few minutes. So, well, hours, whatever. Um, so the, we've got the actual uptime of the container. We can see that the container right now sees four CPUs and 16 gigs of RAM. But we can change that. Set CPU, set memory, and go through. Uptime hasn't changed. We've not restarted the container. We've got two CPUs. We've got, four gigs, we've got one gig of RAM. Um, the limits are applied through C groups, no big surprises there. Um, but C groups are not respected in proc files. So we're using like CFS, which is a fuse file system we wrote a while back. And that's mounted on top of those proc files and gives you the actual output you would expect based on the limits applied to the container. Um, now, Cgroup v2 is obviously something we're looking at. Um, we're currently missing a few things um, in there before we can switch. One of those things is the freezer Cgroup, an equivalent of it. Uh, we do need to occasionally freeze all the tasks in the container in a reliable way. So that's something we need to, to resolve still. Um, we've got. Uh, also, we also need to figure out a nicer way of managing device filters, because that's another thing we need to do, at least for previous containers. And the, the BPF API is a bit tricky to deal with sometimes for that. Um, overall, Cgroup v2 will get us less overhead, safer to use, more suited for containers. Um, we do have a bit of an issue still with legacy workloads. So if you run a system container that uses an init system that configures Cgroups but doesn't know what Cgroup v2 is, on a Cgroup v2 only system, it's going to have a very bad time. So we need to figure out whether we can delay things enough that it's not a case we need to care about because those containers will be end of life, or if we need to do some um, fuse tr trickery or something to fake a Cgroup v1 file system on Cgroup v2, which we've done before. LXCFS does support faking an entire Cgroup v2 tree already, so it's not that much of a stretch for us to do that. But still, we would like to avoid doing it if at all possible. Uh, and lastly, because I'm like, really running out of time, um, another thing that's always kind of exciting is Checkpoint Restore, which lets you do live migration and rollback of state of processes inside a container. It's a very, very complex problem because you need to serialize everything to disk, which is um, yeah, a bit of a pain. Uh, it's also the biggest game of whack a mole in kernel town because every time someone implements a new kernel API, they break checkpoint restore, and they need to figure out a way of getting that stuff out of the kernel into a file so it can be recreated. So that's, that's a lot of fun. Um, rather than go into more details, I can just show you what it looks like when it works, uh, if it works. Um, so let me switch the screen there. All right. So I've got a container running. Now I can do stateful stop. Please work. Yes. So that worked. That container is now gone. It's not running anymore. I could now reboot my system to apply a kernel update or whatever. And then you just start it again. Uh, and it restores. Like if I just do it again, I can show you the mess it creates on the file system. 
that's what happens. Like, for every, like, every single process got a file with dumped of various kernel structures and whatnot. And when you start it, everything is read back and the file, the, all the processes are recreated. That lets you do live migration because you can move that to another machine and restart them. It lets you do, like, say you had your I don't know, IRC bouncer or something and you don't like losing state. Uh, you could totally do that to your container, restart the system to a new kernel, restore it. If you do it quickly enough, your TCP connection might not even have time out. Um, the problem is that, as I said, it's the biggest game of whack-a-mole, and it only works with extremely simple workloads or very, very specific workloads you've tested in the past. And with that, it's the end. Uh, I don't think I actually have any time for questions, so if you've got any, catch me afterwards. Um, we've got stickers here and on the table downstairs if you want those. Thank you very much. <laughs>